Welcome back everybody. This is lecture 2.4.1 and we are going to be looking at some famous Greek thinkers, mathematicians. I'll get to philosophers later. Uh, you also see some scientists and whatnot. So uh, again, stuff that in blue that's in blue is what I want you to know for uh, later on for the exit ticket as well as the, uh, the Greek uh, assessment in midterm. Um, so we're going to look at a couple uh, famous ones, ones that you've probably heard of before, I would hope. Um, so let's let's jump right in. Um, Aristophanes, which is a mouthful to say, um, his name, uh, Ero, Aristophanes, as I always said, pre proved that the wor the Earth was round, and he does it way back in the B.C. times, and in the imagine imagine doing this. He does it before Columbus or you know, even the Vikings can prove that he's right. Um, and the way he does it, he actually takes and notices in two different parts of the world um, that the way the sun hits a stick casts a different shadow at different latitudes. And so he's able to extrapolate the arc of from here to here with the distance. And by measuring the angle of the sun at the same time in the same part of the year, he is able to fin he's able to figure out this arc and once he's able to get this arc he's then able to estimate how big the rest of the earth is so uh, kudos to him the, the fact that he's able to do it is pretty amazing and uh, a couple of his other buddies who were math mathematicians Euclid was um, the father of geometry so really mr. D'Amico can um, be thankful because he wrote the book called The Elements, and all of, a lot of the uh, postulates and a lot of the basic parts of uh, geometry are all contained in his book. So um, you definitely want to write his name down and know his book. In fact, uh, Mr. D'Amico has this above his desk. So um, this is all stuff. Like when you're over there and you think you're learning cutting-edge math, uh, I got news for you. You're learning ancient math. Uh, the Greeks are the ones that came up with uh, geometry and trig and the, you know, the Arabs invented algebra so none of the math you're learning is new Isaac Newton invented calculus he would live back in the 1800s so most of the math you're learning is hundreds if not thousands of years old um, his buddy his boy that he used to hang out with Euclid uh, his buddy was and you know this guy Pythagoras right and obviously when you're doing solving for the hypotenuse uh, the Pythagorean theorem so um, I imagine you already are familiar with this guy because uh, I know you guys have to know this for your keystone, right? So, anyway, we've got Euclid, we've got Pythagoras. These are two uh, Athenian mathematicians. And then there's also scientists. And this guy, his name was Archimedes. Archimedes is uh, one day sitting in his bathtub and uh, he figures out why things float. I don't know if he was like reaching for the rubber duck or whatever but um, one day he decides like, he has to build this giant boat and he's not sure how he's gonna make it without sinking and we'll get to that in the next slide the other thing that Archimedes uh, invented was the idea of a fulcrum and a lever and like here's the fulcrum and then the lever and his quote was give me a place to stand and I will move the earth meaning there's no object big too big that can't be moved if you have the proper leverage and a fulcrum, so simple machines. So he's kind of like a uh, engineer, someone that designs things. And the back to Archimedes' principle, why things float. So if I take a piece of metal and I just toss it in the pond, it'll sink. But if I pound that metal into a hull, which then displaces this much water, uh, it pushes down on the water and the water pushes back with equal force. And this is why big, heavy things can float. It's the law of buoyancy, which basically you probably learned in maybe Mr. Stewart's class or in science, that any body or particularly, um, it's, it's saying any body partially or completely submerged in fluid is buoyed by a force, up by force equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the body, which is explaining why things float. Or more importantly, uh, if you look at an ocean liner and you think, my God, that thing weighs so many tons, how does it stay above water? It's because of all of the um, displacement that pushes it back up. So, and I have a video I'll show you about that too. All right, another thing Archimedes came up with is the water screw. It's like a corkscrew. You turn the handle, 
and it actually scoops water up and then water flows up the corkscrew and uphill. Now this is before they had sump pumps or electric pumps or anything like that, but here's a picture of a guy using it in modern times. Like he can get water from the from the river up into his crops. And this is a better side view that shows you how each screw brings the water up and then it kind of like gets scooped up to the next level. And as long as someone's turning the screw, water's flowing uphill. So that's you know, that's kind of a way that water, and that's, again, Archimedes was a brilliant guy, and uh, he was more of a, like, an engineer type f figure. Uh, he also had some crazy ideas. He had this thing that would, like, swing down and hook uh, ships, um, and almost like this, you can sort of see. I don't know if this is off Minecraft or whatever, but, like, it looks like a video game. But anyway, it gets the point across. Like, it would reach down and snack, snag one of these ships. There were these giant ballistas, which would fire, like, huge like um, spears uh, he also tried to do something with like a magnifying glass and reflective rays and I don't know if legend has it but he tried to build a giant magnifying glass so he could catch ships on fire um, I can't recall if it worked but I'm um, sure people could google it or whatever they wanted catapult so he would come up with different siege engines to protect Syracuse which was the city that he was from which is over by Italy which is a Greece colony so we consider him Greek even though he didn't live in Athens all right uh, another guy to talk about is Phidias and Phidias was a sculptor and he was um, in charge of making the giant statue for Zeus at Olympia remember Olympics were like a game that or a series of games that were made to honor the gods mainly Zeus because Zeus was the main god and at Olympia was this giant temple and inside was this statue which was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world made by Phidias and people were like well how are you going to make this thing look right you know if you were I try to draw a picture of a person um, it might end badly if you don't have training but a lot of problems with artists is trying to get the proportion like is the head like too big, too small, or the hands tiny, or are they in proportion to like the body? And so imagine carving something or making something, and then you really have to... Phidias doesn't just make this uh, statue. He makes the Athena statue in Athens. and So Phidias uses this mathematical formula, which is called the golden mean, or the golden ratio. And I'm just going to have you jot down what it is. Uh, it's called the golden mean, or the golden ratio, and you are probably familiar with its neighbor, which is pi, uh, 3.14, which is an irrational number that the Greeks also used. All right, and pi, by the way, is that symbol, and phi is this symbol. All right, which remember this we're talking about like these are different Greek Greek letters. And notice, like what I'm showing you here is the ratio is 1.6 is what you want to focus on, right? So a is 1.6 the length of AB, okay? And, or you could say, like, A is 1.6 the length of B, okay? This is called a golden rectangle, or the golden mean, okay? It's just like, it's a rectangle that looks like it's perfect. And it's because it's in this apportionment of 1.6. Now, that might seem, you might be like, yeah, big deal, Farrell, who cares? Like, yeah, so it's an apportion. Well, it is a big deal, because take a look at the human body. Uh, this is the drawing by da Vinci, so we'll just use it. But the blue, okay, is 1.6 the length of the red. And the red would start from your belly button down to the floor, okay? So not only, like, is this number used throughout, like, you'll see... 1.6 this this ratio all throughout things so the Greeks they kind of knew that this number was important this 1.6 and so when we look at what are golden rectangles you'll see the perfect golden rectangle and then you scale it up 1.6 scale it up 1.6 scale it up 1.6 and just keep scaling it up 1.6 and you get what's called a bunch of golden rectangles but notice the measurements of the Parthenon, right? And you kind of have to think of it as the golden mean, the golden ratio, the golden rectangles. And you could actually like take a line and draw like a spiral through like an arc, which is oftentimes known as Fibonacci numbers. And you can actually see this spiral, this curl 
uh, occur all throughout nature. And the Greeks knew, hey, this golden mean, this golden rectangle, the what's also known as the Fibonacci numbers, or the Fibonacci spiral. Fibonacci is this Italian who figured out these numbers later because he was breeding rabbits, and every time he'd have rabbits, baby rabbits, they would have the next grouping of golden ratio numbers of babies. So, long story short, these golden rectangles have this thing called the, the Fibonacci or the golden... Um, um, the golden mean has the Fibonacci spiral, and we see it pop up all over the place. If we take and took those, if we take those golden rectangles and we make a Fibonacci curl, you can see the apportionment. You can see how the mathematics work with the structure of the building. But then, okay, so yeah, it's in the building, but oh, by the way, it's in nature. Look at the Nautilus shell or a snail, right? any kind of mollusk. Look at a sunflower seed. When you take the pattern and you spin outward from the center uh, on the head of a sunflower, or take the spiral of a galaxy and the way it spins outward. All right, is feral baking your brain yet? I'm hoping. I'm hoping I'm putting you to sleep. But this golden mean, this golden rectangle is found all over the place. Even your ear conforms to that golden mean or that golden ratio and well oh, there's donald oh trump conforms to the golden ratio how about that so all right so yeah there's the donald made an appearance in in my lecture all right so when we look at like a pine cone can you see the spiral can you see the curl if you start in the middle and then like work your way out you'll see the golden ratio the golden mean is in pine cones or various types of seeds or flowers, right? And it's always 1.6. Uh, even like weird things like cactuses or flowers or hurricanes or sometimes mollusks or spider web, spider web sometimes. Not all the time. But then it gets really freaky. Like when you start looking at apportionment in the human figure, it is what makes something beautiful. So like your eyes, your nose, your mouth, if it is not in apportionment, if it conforms to the golden rectangle, then that is what looks pleasing or beautiful to the human eye. So um, a friend of mine went to model school, and they had to do a computer scan of her face. And she asked, well, why are you scanning my face? And they're like, we're checking the five points. We're looking to see, are your eyes the proper space? Is your nose too big or too small? Are your teeth or your eyes like... Everything on the human figure conforms to the golden ratio, the golden. And here we go again. Look, when you look at your thumbprint, Fibonacci curl, again, uses 1.6. And so I'm just moving this. The Greeks knew that 1.6 or phi was the golden ratio of which all things were made. And that's pretty cool. And again, when we look at something like the Parthenon, you might say, well, yeah, big deal. It's a big building. No, they're honoring the gods. They knew 1.6 was huge. And so the golden ratio is all throughout their buildings, all throughout their art. And later on, other cultures are going to adapt. And I'm, I'm sure the Greeks didn't discover this either. It was probably even before them. But uh, later on, we're going to see it pop up throughout the uh, Renaissance and later on during the Enlightenment. So like 1.6 was huge, and it really goes back to Phi, Phidias, right? Which, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop, and that's it. I hope I didn't break your brain too bad, but that is a little bit about Greek math, all right?